when you have facial hair, that gives you diplomacy, especially when you're adding <laughs> 50s, right? Or the, tw- or the 2018 annual council. That's right. That's right. Today, October 22, is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Hey gang, welcome to a very special episode of the Avenus History Podcast. I know we just had a very special episode of the Avenus History Podcast. Well, now we have another very special episode of the Avenus History Podcast. Boy, is that a mouthful. But I am here, sitting down, sort of, across the pond with Kyle Morris. And Kyle has made an Adventist board game. Kyle, can you tell us about this? What do you mean you made an Adventist board game? Yeah, well, I guess uh, it's true. I made an Adventist board game uh, for the purpose of Adventists playing a game that somehow adds value or relevance or identity and mission and purpose to their life rather than something that just distracts us or, or wastes time, even though some of those time wasters are fun. So, All right. Well, yeah. listen, I got to ask the first question. It's going to be the one that everybody's going to want to hear about, and that is... Dear Pastor, am I allowed to play this board game on Sabbath? <laughs> we um, we were doing during the test playing phase, uh, me, Brad, and Carl, the three guys that made it. Um, during the test playing phase, there was a few moments where we broke the rules. We broke the mechanics of the game, and we started to – we're obviously very competitive, the three of us <laughs> – and we started to get really competitive and, you know, temper started to rise. And, and I looked at them and I was like, oh, man, we're not going to be able to play this game on the Sabbath. Uh, I personally have had an experience where I've ended up with a split open forehead because of a competitive uh, paddling incident on the water on the Sabbath. And um, after that time, I sort of decided to myself that things that are competitive, I should avoid on the Sabbath. And so I'm very tempted to put within the instructions like a little badge or a little warning <clears throat> suggesting that this game is not necessarily Sabbath approved by the creators of it. But um, as it relates to the creator of the world and whether or not he approves of you playing this on the Sabbath, you'll have to take that up with him. But this game is not intended to be a Sabbath afternoon time waster. But but on that point, I'm very heavily considering trying to create um, maybe an expansion pack in the very near future that allows this game to be a cooperative game using the same pieces, the same okay. board. Now, you're a, you're a pastor, right? You work for a conference there. Tell us a little bit about your background and where you're coming from in approaching this board game. Sure. Um, yeah, grew up here on the east coast of Australia and um, have been living in Kurenbong, which is um, what Australia's version of Loma Linda or um, yeah, southern. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah, the only yeah. college in Australia. ghetto, as we, as we call them here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I live in Avondale or Kurenbong is the official suburb. And um, man, we just got a lot of friends who like playing games. Um, but there's not a lot to do in Kurenbong. Um, people refer to Kurenbong as a bit of a hole, but I really like the place. But it's true, there's not a lot to do on Saturday nights. And so uh, it was time to create a game. Me personally, I had a marketing degree and then a theology degree, and I've been working for the church for four years. Um, employed by the North New South Wales Conference. And um, yeah, as I networked with people and, and met people talking about this idea, it just seems to be something that uh, we haven't done. And I've always been wondering, why haven't we done this? But now that I'm, you know, most of the way through the process of trying to achieve it, I can understand why somebody hasn't done it before. Yeah. It's now, you process. mentioned that this was a, a competitive game in its current form. You may expand it later to kind of introduce cooperative elements. Uh, so kind of walk us through how this game works. Like, what are we as players competing to to try and do with this game? Sure. So the game's uh, for two to six players. And the aim of the game is the most total member involvement before the second coming wins. So essentially, you play the game aiming to collect TMI. And those TMI are your victory points. And when the second coming strikes, you add up your TMI and you see who's won. <laughs> But of course, everybody's a winner at the second coming if we've done our part, right? And so <laughs> the way that you gain TMI is by participating in Adventist life uh, or the ideal Adventist life, you could say. So when you go to church, you gain scripture. When you go to prayer meeting, you gain faith. When you go on outreach, you gain experience. 
So it's sort of um, a bit of an analogy for life, right? And with these resources, you invest those resources in church organizational growth or in special cards. And in that special card deck, there's mission trips, spiritual gifts, and single-use events that sort of change or amplify the way that you play. Um, when you're at church level, you're earning one resource around the outside of the board. When you're at conference level, you start earning two resources. When you're at division level, you start earning three resources. As you build up the organization, you start earning more things and you're able to do more things. This is the most Adventist board game possible. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just dying over here. This is the most Adventist thing we've ever created. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the plan. That's the plan. But um, yeah, there's no reason why others can't play it as well. I hope, I hope this gets a little bit of traction in the Christian world, um, but it certainly is full of Adventist lingo. So there's a deck of special, uh, sorry, life cards. So there's life cards and special cards. Life cards are just like the random community chest style events around the outside of the board. There's a few of them. And there's a deck of 40 cards that have quotes from either Ellen White or the Pioneers. And these are just genuine life events that the Pioneers went through um, as they were striving to spread the church around the world, which is, in fact, what you're doing while you're playing the game. You're spreading uh, church organization throughout the world. So, for example, um, Uriah Smith, when he lost his leg, um, there's a card that says <laughs> amputation, and then it has a brief um, excerpt of the experience of that amputation of his leg when he was 12 years old. This is so awesome. And that's a negative card, right? That's not a fun experience. And so <laughs> for that card, for that card, you get one experience and that's it. Whereas if you get into literature evangelism, well, that's actually more lucrative. So you actually earn finance experience and faith for that life card this is the best thing i've ever seen in my life i only wish i would have thought of this so so if, if you're if you're if you're if you're a long time listener to this podcast and you're like what's the avenus history angle here what what does this got to do with avenus history uh there there you go it's kind of like you're you're stepping back and and developing the church and you're learning about our pioneers and about ellen white uh which sounds really cool so the original map was actually like an old scroll. Um, it was like this historic piece, this artifact, and it had a real theme and style to it. And it was if it was like a throwback to the 1850s. Um, and you essentially take on the role of a pioneer and it's your job to roll the dice and, you know, play the game in order to finish the world, for example. Um, but as the artwork developed, it got a lot more bright and fun and, and interesting looking. But the idea is still the same. It's a bit of a throwback. These are the events that happened. This is what it was like to live the life of a pioneer planning the church, um, you know, the Great Commission. And that's why it's called Go Ye, right? It's our job. It's what we've been put here to do. And the game is intended to be somewhat of a subconscious teaching tool. Imagine if your teenage kids grew up playing this game, understanding what hardships the pioneers went through, understanding that when I go to church, I can actually gain scripture and then invest that later on in the church organizational structure. Uh, diplomacy is one of the other resources, and so it helps to gain diplomacy. <laughs> you can pull a life card that says grow a mustache or grow a beard, and that's also uh, some quotes from Uriah Smith about the fact that <clears throat> his comments on facial hair that he actually published in um, the magazine of the time, its uh, that was a few months ago now that I added that card, and so I've forgotten where he wrote it. But it's on the card. It's referenced on the card. And um, when you have facial hair, that gives you diplomacy, especially in the 1850s, right? <laughs> Or the, twi or the 2018 annual council. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's the point of the game. It's an analogy for okay. the game of life of the ideal Adventist pioneer. And your job is to finish the world, to get as many members involved in this movement as possible, because Jesus is ultimately, is ultimately coming. And um, yeah, we want to do the best we can do with, with his support. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Some rapid fire little questions. Number one, do sure. ha do haystacks feature in the gameplay at all? Look, they don't, unfortunately. Uh, they weren't introduced into Adventism until much later, but I do have some very solid plans for a haystack related product. So stay tuned. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Number two, how, how much, uh, like how detailed is the development of the church? Like can we change history so that uh, Southern takes the, the prime spot over Andrews? Um, can we ordain women somehow in this game? Like, what, what, how much flexibility does one have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not a lot. Well, not a lot. So, essentially, the mechanics just involve planning churches, conferences, divisions, and the general conference across the world map. The okay. GC, 
and the division stamps are all in the same place. The conference layout is already there. There's 10 divisions and 58 conferences on this map. And so it's not a, um, it's not an accurate split, but we already have plans to create a North American board rather than a worldwide board. It's a North American board. Therefore, we can reintroduce the union level, oh. take out the GC level. The division level would be the top level. The NAD would be the kingpin spot. Uh, the unions would be back in, and we actually try and get a literal conference breakup in that map. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of how the mechanics wow. work at this stage. So, so with that, like in that NAD map, for instance, because I, I imagine mm -hmm. uh, like most people who listen to this podcast are in the NAD. The second most is uh, li like a group of listeners is in Australia. Um, but if we take yep. the NAD map, like are we talking about conferences divided as they are now or like in 1900 or like it no it would be it would be the split right now so okay. the reason the board only has 58 conferences is because it's a very long game to play already and the way the mechanics are set up and the way that the development happened um it just it is the way it is i wish things could be better i wish things could be different but they can't it just is the way it is so we're gonna have to put up with it for now sure um in this format until i create another game that's different um, but 50, 58 seemed to be a good ideal number to have a game that lasts anywhere from one hour to two hours. Sure. Uh, for first time players, it's going to last a little bit longer, maybe two and a half as you get to learn the rules. But once you're efficient at the game, you could, you could get it done in an hour and 20 minutes with uh, two other friends that know how to play the game. And so, yeah, that's, that's just the way it sort of landed. Yeah. And it's still like 842 hours shorter than Monopoly. Correct. Correct. So, <laughs> man, that's great. Like, so, okay. You had this idea at some point. To, to do a board game and I'm sure that idea kind of changed and developed and sharpened over time but okay yeah. if somebody's out there like I had a great board game or card game idea like what's what do you do with that idea like what's your first step like can you kind of just walk us through what it takes to develop a board game sure so um, it was just a dream and I'm the kind of guy that has a lot of dreams and not all of them make it to fruition um, in fact, the majority of them don't. And so this game started with us just getting a piece of butcher's paper, a large piece of paper and drawing on it with textures, um, what we thought the game would be. And then we, um, we got some dice. We stole the pieces off a risk board, like all the little, um, the little plastic pieces out of a risk set. And then we started playing. And within about three minutes, we realized our idea was dumb and that we had forgotten a lot of things that you need in a game. And so we stopped. And then <laughs> a few days later, I thought, no, 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 let's not give up. Let's not give up. Let's, uh, let's add some mechanics to make that work. And that was basically the beginning of uh, probably a solid year and a half of test playing regularly where we were having to tweak significantly the mechanics or the, uh, the framework by which we could play the game to make it work. And then throughout that year and a half, you have to develop your artwork to keep up with the mechanical changes of the rules. And so... Um, once that process was done, we were basically at a stage where we had to start either investing significant amounts of money in artwork and, uh, you know, more development to take this to market, or we just stop. And we've basically had fun for a year and a half developing something that almost works. And so literally even, even a week ago, we played the game and I realized that the game is slightly imbalanced towards, uh, mission trips and not, um, not quite as balanced towards uh, church organizational growth. There's far more TMI to be earned when the church is organized rather than just everyone do whatever you want to do. And so I realized that even now I'm still tweaking the mechanics to try and make this as balanced as possible so that the, the final player can actually enjoy playing this time and time again rather than just like play it once or twice and, you know, you've figured out how to win, so you stop playing. So it's, it's just a huge process. Um, a lot of artwork, a lot of uh, designers from around the world that I've been working with and, and you'll get a designer that's willing to work for a few weeks and then they just stop and they're sick of it and they don't want to work anymore or they blackmail you for your artwork. I had a, I had a guy what? blackmail me for what? artwork. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was on, it was on one of these websites where you have to leave feedback and, um, basically, uh, they had finished that contract. And I left some feedback. I left like three and a half or four star feedback and it was honest feedback. And then they went ahead and, and basically wouldn't release the last bit of money. There's the money is held like in limbo until they complete the work and both parties are happy. And however it worked out, they ended up with a couple hundred dollars and wouldn't release my files, my artwork until 
I changed my artwork, sorry, my review to a five-star review. And I said, but you didn't deserve a five-star re- review. You only did a four-star job. And they said, well, that's fine. We just won't give you your files. What? And so I had, I had to get on customer service and like actually get them to go in the back end and change my review. And I told them that I was being blackmailed while they were, they were doing it. But they were just like, well, if this is really what you want to do. And I said, well, it's the only way I'll get my artwork. So Okay. Okay. But so after you got your yeah. artwork, can you go back in again and change it? I, I could have and I should have, but I was just happy to get off that platform no doubt, and, no doubt. and run away. Run yeah, to the yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Now, I understand one time you even had to fly to Hong Kong in order to kind of get the development going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so essentially, I'd spent thousands and thousands of dollars and... um I realized that, well, I either pull out now or I have to invest thousands more in order to, you know, seem like I know what I'm doing because I'm not a publisher. And so, um, yeah, basically found a friend who's willing to go further with me on this. And um, we decided the best thing to do is to go to Hong Kong and just find a publisher that, we're, uh, sorry, not a publisher, a um, manufacturer that we're happy with. We can look them in the eyes. We can talk to them. We can make sure that their product is legitimate. And, um, we decided to do that. So yeah, we flew to Hong Kong. We went to this big toy and game expo fair thing. And it was like about the second day of a week long trip. And we're walking around this fair with like hundreds of thousands of people in Hong Kong. And we realized we're at the wrong fair. We're, we're so rookie that we booked ourselves international tickets to go to the wrong oh fair. My. These were toys that were, oh, <laughs> these are toys that were already manufactured, ready to go to the shops. And we were looking for an OEM manufacturer, somebody who'd make a product from scratch. And everybody at this fair was only interested in selling the things that they'd already produced. And so even though we stuffed up that bad, we were still able to make contact with four OEM manufacturers as well as one that I'd already been in communication with for about a year and a half. And uh, we went to some of their factories. We went to the head offices. We had conversations with um, the the guy who created the pie face game uh, where you get like a cream pie in the face. Okay. Um, you can YouTube it. Uh, it's quite funny. We were chatting with that guy, the the original manager of the game company that got really? that game going, and they sold six, sixteen million games in what? two years of Pie wow. Face. Yep. So we ended up going with that. We ended up going with that company, and they basically make games for Hasbro. So Hasbro is just a label. They don't actually make their own games. They use this company and other companies to make their games. Wow. So I mean, man, this is it's, this is not just. Uh having an idea one day and then uh, getting on a, a website like Vistaprint or something and just printing off a game board. I mean, like you are deeply invested in this. It's a lot of legwork, a lot of time. I can't wait to play this. When when can people play this game? Like when do you think it's going to hit the United States or, or be on sale in Australia? Yeah. So, so the aim is to launch a Kickstarter campaign in July. Um, and... July, hopefully, July, August, hopefully enough people within 40 days pledge their allegiance to this game <laughs> with their wallet. And then if we get enough pledged allegiance to Adventist gaming, then what we can do, or, you know, or Christian gaming in general, what we can do is we can um, go ahead and place a minimum order with this uh, manufacturer. And um, right now we're just trying to nail down the distribution and the, um, you know, the shipping around the world. That's a really big hassle to know how much to charge. And, um, the conflict, beautiful guys I can see, um, have had to go through all this same stuff. You've got to figure out, um, how heavy it is, how big it is, what the cheapest method is. Uh, we're doing all that now. So we're hoping to deliver it before Christmas. Um, I don't want to let people down. So I'm suggesting that maybe February might be more accurate. Um, hopefully we can get it out of China before the Chinese new year in January, late January. Um, and hopefully we can get it shipped um, by early next year, but hopefully wow. Christmas. And I can't wait to get my hands on this game and and give it a give it a shot. So there you go, listeners. Uh, the Kickstarter is going to be launching in July sometime, and uh, we'll keep you updated on when that page goes live. We'll link it onto our Facebook page. For now, I guess they can go to goye.games, and that's where you can actually subscribe to be um, given notifications as things progress. So goye.games, G-O-Y-E dot perfect, games. Perfect, perfect. So head on over there, guys. And, you know, I don't. I haven't even seen a picture, like, a, like an in-depth picture of this board. I've seen the box from a bit of a distance, but I am totally stoked. I want to play this game. I want to do a YouTube video on our channel of me playing this game. I think this is going to be a blast. So 
head on over to uh, to Goyi and uh, pay attention to when that Kickstarter is launching. This is going to be so great. Goyi.games. That is where it's at. And by the way, while we're waiting for the Kickstarter to launch, Kyle is also a host of a podcast, Avenus on Fire. And I don't want to neglect that at all. So you can, you can give that a listen as well. Thanks, man. I've actually been neglecting that while I'm working on this game. So I appreciate yeah, the hey, love. No problem, man. We, we have this <laughs> podcasters got to stay together. Let me ask you one final question, Kyle, before you go is I, I know like there's still a mountain of work and effort ahead of you in getting this game into people's hands. Um, but is this just the beginning of a series of games that you'd like to to design or is this kind of like a, hey i had an idea i just want to get it out and uh, then i'm going to move on to the next thing and that's a really good question in the process of doing this project over the last three years i've already created three other projects um <clears throat> now they're decks of cards so we've got one called catch canaan and it's essentially a a remake of a classic but it's all brand new artwork and, and a slight twist on the mechanics of that game. Um, but that'll be a card game that'll be much cheaper, more affordable, easier to ship, 12-player um, game instead of a six-player game, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, we, we tested it at one of our camp meetings over here with 12, 12 guys from the Arise um, Discipleship School, and I laughed so hard that my voice was sore for a few days. My throat was sore for a few days. Um, so that one's basically ready to go, but I just I need to focus on one thing at a time. And then we had some small group resources and I tried launching them via an app, but I just didn't have time to market it. So I pulled the app offline and we'll probably go with a physical uh, product in the future. So essentially, Goyi Entertainment will be um, hopefully a publishing name in the future that will produce more content for Christendom and for That's the Adventist fantastic. Church. Now, I know you're, you're wrapped up in this, but it sounds like you're building for the future here. If somebody listening to this is like, I have a solid, not at all flaky... Uh, idea for a game should they contact you yeah why not well, i'm yeah for sure <laughs> get in <All> touch right. <laughs> now i want to interpret what he just said for you guys okay because it sounded really obvious well, let me interpret it to you if you have some hair brain poorly thought out thing he doesn't want to hear from you okay like you need to have this thing thought out <laughs> i'm gonna be your tra- i'm gonna be your translator i'm creative too like yeah, thanks. No, even if the idea sucks, like we can <laughs> we can work with that. I guess like here's the crazy thing that I've learned. If you take your idea to a publisher, if that publisher is interested and willing to work with you, you will likely only get three percent of sales. Three percent of the profit. And and it doesn't matter how many years you've invested in your idea. And so essentially I've learned through this process that there is no money in in any of this really there's just not we just don't have the economies of scale and so that's inspiring um basically you have to, you have to be prepared to spend a lot of money for no return perfect <laughs> and waste all of your spare time i credit i credit this success the success of the design of this game to my singleness uh this this game has been my wife now for years and um at this stage it's going nowhere fast so if you want a future like that, then please get in touch with me. I'd Man, that is an inspiring vision. I'm, the, <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. So anyways, man, Kyle, bless you. Thanks so much for taking some time and, and talking with us and, and sharing your vision. I, you know what? I, I love this, not just because of the particulars of the game, not just because of the mechanics or the artwork. I love this because you are helping to build a healthy, vibrant, avenous culture. That is definitely Avenus weird, which is what I love more than anything else uh, in the world. So <laughs> thank you so much, man, for your dedication and your passion project um, and, and, and kind of just helping make Adventism cool. Uh, so bless you, man. My pleasure. Thanks for your time. All right. Yeah. We'll see you later, brother. <laughs>